Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to our Nordic uh, Consumer Webinar. I'm Henrik kramberg Alvers, and I'm heading the Nordic Consumer Market for India. And we'd just like to welcome everybody to this uh, early morning call. In these webinars, we could focus on how consumers are reacting, what are their needs, but also look into different economic scenarios on how this will impact the consumer and retail industry with a special focus on the Nordic. May I kindly ask that you all put on your uh, systems on mute and if you have any questions, please use the comment field or, or please reach out to us on our emails. If you would like to participate in further webcast, you can see the QR code here where you can scan it. Uh, and there you will also have the opportunity to sign up for our newsletters where we will also give you some more insights on how we see the world developing with a special focus on the consumers in the Nordic. Also, if you like what you hear, uh, please share with your colleagues and, uh, and invite them. They are more than welcome to participate as well. Today, uh, the session for the 30 minutes will be headed by Anas and Michael, whom you can see here on the screen. Uh, Anas will talk about the changed consumer behaviors and, and how they are changing as we go along with the COVID-19 situation. And then Michael will come in and talk a little about what are the likely economic scenarios that we see in our sectors. So let me hand over to you, Anas, to take us through the first part of the session. Thank you, uh, Henrik. Um, if we could have the next uh, slide, please. Uh, so about two months ago, uh, the pandemic arrived to the Nordic uh, countries, and it really threw us into an existence that we weren't really prepared for. Uh, so we wanted to know how people reacted, why they reacted as they did, and what brands could do to relieve this sense of distress and uncertainty. So the result, as you know, were these five distinct personas, and we have gotten to know them very well. And it's kind of sad to say, but this is probably, probably the last time you will see them. Because we now see um, that these personas, they have changed a lot. They have changed so much that today we want to introduce you to a complete set of new consumer groups. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we now introduce, that we are talking about uh, new people. It simply means that these personas represented reactions during the very first phase of the pandemic. And that collective shock that this was to all of us. So we are now moving from a kind of traumatized consumer to some kind of a post-traumatic consumer. And this might sound a little bit strange and surprising because the pandemic is far from over. Uh, but in the Nordic countries, we have obtained a minimum of control and we learn more and more about the virus every day. So, but the most important thing, of course, is that human beings, they really adapt fast. So most of the Nordic consumers seem to have moved on from the initial phase of shock and extreme uncertainty to acceptance. And that's when a lot of interesting stuff happened. I also believe that opportunities now are getting more and more clear. We have two months of experience with our pandemic lives, but and it's not a lot, but the, but the things we should act on are growing more and more obvious. For instance, uh, having experienced the fear of not being able to buy the goods they want, when they want, delivery and availability are rising as important success factors for most businesses. 51% of consumers now define product availability as increasingly important and 41% to do so for availability of delivery slots. And we still don't know how the pandemic will play out and uh, Mikael will give us some very interesting perspectives on that today and how to deal with that uncertainty. But we now have fresh insights on how people reacted to the pandemic in the first place. That makes it a lot easier to imagine how they will act depending on whether or not the pandemic simply dies out, whether or not we get a second wave, or in worst case, multiple new waves. The Spanish flu came in three waves. The one hitting the hardest was the second wave. So depending on your business, you might have to plan for that. Well, when planning for a second wave or another scenario, 
take into consideration what uh, Mikael will tell you uh, about in a bit, but also take into consideration everything we are still learning from the initial wave of the pandemic. So people are now reconfiguring their habits. To many, the pandemic is like hitting some kind of a pause button. It's a pause to reflect, to readapt, and to redefine actually how we live our lives. And these kind of processes take some time to settle, but that is what we believe is happening as we speak. Our initial personas, they simply don't cover what is going on anymore. They were a useful tool to understand the first reactions and changes in behavior. But as time passes on and people are getting used to our new ways of living, people once again change and in such a considerable way that we simply had to reboot our personas completely. And, and let me just be clear on this. We are not talking about new people that we have discovered. We are talking about an evolution of these consumer groups. So we are sharing this with you because even those the most dramatic COVID headlines, at least in the Nordics, are calming down, consumers, they are still in some metamorphosis due to COVID-19 and it has only begun. For instance, we see that people are getting less loyal to their brands and the situation drives them to discover new and other brands as they are navigating the pandemic. And people are also demanding completely new things from brands. 38% of respondents completely agree that brands have a responsibility to make positive change, but only 15% completely agree that the positive actions taken by brands are good enough. So going for, forward, consumers expect many lifestyle changes to happen, including 31% that believe that their health management will change and 27% for eating habits. Some consumer segments are planning to release savings to continue to spend, but of course, many, and actually the majority, is cutting down. 53% spend less money now than before the pandemic. And these are the kind of new findings that shape our six new consumer groups. We see that consumers, the consumers reacting with anger and irritation in the beginning, the annoyed consumer group, is moving into a state of boredom. And what is interesting is that the cynics are actually merging with them. So two types of frustrations are blending into one common feeling of resignation, but also extreme readiness to regain normality. However, uh, the board have a strong belief that recession is coming. The pragmatic consumer group is now splitting into two. One of the new consumer group is the consistent. They are starting to fall back into a rather unchanged consumption now. However, the second split is what we call the hopeful consumer group. And these are more careful with their spending than the consistent. They are in general younger and their daily lives turned out to be more affected by the pandemic than they first thought. So therefore they are now worried about spending. They are filling their shopping carts in different web shops, the digital kind of version of window shopping. However, they don't hit the pay button. The hedonists that were characterized by, the, by their trading up and enjoying themselves through the crisis is moving into a slightly different state. They continue to trade up for certain product categories, but they are starting to put most of their spending into exploring new playing fields. So they have time and, uh, and money to spend, and they are searching new experiences and new meaningful activities. The neurotic group is also split into two, as you can see. Uh, and we see that fear now either creates a reaction of saving, uh, this group we simply call the saver, um, and they are very pessimistic about the future and do some deep cuts into their spending. The second group is what we call the immobilized, and they are a group we all need to care about. They are forced to continue the isolation since they are in a group at risk. They might be senior citizens or they have a disease, and the, their direct effects of the pandemic will affect them the longest, 
And for some of them, especially the elderly, they are in a way forced into not being able to do their shopping. They are not very digital and they don't want to leave their house, but they are a considerable group. So, so how can you enable them to get what they need and what they want anyway? Um, next slide, uh, please. And so we believe that these new personas, they first and foremost, they represent a whole new set of opportunities. And during the weeks to come, we will continue to collect insights on their needs and spending patterns. And closer to summer, we will, uh, we will gather all of these insights and share them with you. And we believe that they will give a good baseline to understand the new consumer. Uh, but like we have said so many times, it all depends on how the pandemic will play out and the economic consequences of that. So uh, Mikael, uh, which is um, at our Stockholm office, he will tell us a little bit more about this. He will help us now to zoom back out again from the consumer to the potential economic scenarios due to the pandemic. Um, and he will give us a deeper understanding on how to act on that. So um, Mikael, please. Thank you, Anders. My name is Mikael Karlsson and work in the transaction strategy side at EY, EY Parthenon. And today we will talk about potential economic scenarios and their impact on the consumer sector. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Nordic economies are facing a steep decline with an 8 to 11 percentage drop in GDP by, by the summertime or first half of 2020. And uh, of course, there are many much statistics coming out right now, and uh, and there are many sources for for forecasts. We have uh, what we display here is the Oxford Economics version of of the future. And the question mark here is what what happens next when not knowing what to, what what will happen? We use scenarios and hypotheses on the future to help guide us. That. This is uh, what we're going to talk about today. First, we will discuss the potential economic scenarios based on the impact of COVID-19. Secondly, we'll talk about the impact this situation has led to both in the short term and for the longer term for the consumer industry. The third step would be to decide on actions to meet these scenarios and hypotheses, basically planning, planning your response. Determine the most likely scenario you believe in and plan against that. This way you create something firm to think about rather than having a moving target. Uh, of course, no one knows what the right scenario is. However, we decide on a scenario based on the information we have today. And when new information arrives, we update our scenario and change our plans to meet that updated scenario. Eva, Parthenon has developed potential scenarios for how the health crisis might shape economies across Europe. And uh, what we're looking at right now, it, it's not a forecast, but rather different types of development that we can see right now that we're heading towards. And no one knows how this will turn out and the graphs should be uh, seen as purely illustrative. And uh, you see three lines, and uh, the first line to, uh, to introduce is the V scenario. I think you've heard it uh, before, and it's, um, it is uh, what we believe the least likely at the moment in Europe. It's a sharp decline and a quick recovery back to pre-crisis pre level. The W scenario is a sharp decline followed by a short recovery period and, and uh, followed by a second dip. The tick scenario is a sharp decline and then a gradual improvement over time with continuous small um, improvements and setbacks uh, on a continuous basis. The depth and the length of the scenarios are illustrative in this picture, but also our, our uh, view right now is that we the the recovery for the W and the V scenario back to today's level will take years uh, until we, we are fully fully there. So the, the question is which and, and, and also to add to this that the scenarios here we look at this is 
they can they vary country by country. So the another question is, which scenario do you believe is most likely for your country? And to help you think a bit about that, and or to show you how we are thinking about that, we are we are looking at indicators for each scenario. The V scenario is indicated by an effective control of the virus and that the pandemic can be isolated and eradicated within three to four months. And the W scenario is that the incident rate is is seasonal, uh, similar to the Spanish flu uh, we heard uh, Anders talk about previously. And that we come into uh, uh, it is easing over, over the summer period and then coming back. And an indicator for that is uh, also the um, that antibody testing reveals that 60% of 60% or less uh, of the population have had the virus in the first round. The tick scenario is indicated by government restrictions imposed to slow down the virus, not limit it, and and uh, that immunity in, in the society uh, starts to occur. And and thinking about this three scenarios on, on a general level, we, we, uh, we choose to we select three areas to, to uh, look more deeper into to help us guide what, what, is most, what could be most relevant in each country. First one is the, the COVID-19 development, basically the virus development in society, which include everything from the countermeasures like social distancing potential antivirals coming, immunity occurring, and availability to vaccines. And, and this is basically how is the virus itself going to, to uh, develop in, in society. The second part is uh, the government stimulus packages that each government are imposing um, with aim to try to mitigate the negative effects on the economy. And the third uh, dimension to, to uh, think about is the consumer reactions and and uh, more of when the day when the virus itself is no longer the main threat how long will it take for for um, for consumers to go back to normal and of course that normal is going to be be uh, um, very likely not very likely the same as the normal we have seen before but the activity level are going to be uh, when are we coming back to the same activity level as before. So on the next page, we will do um, a bit of a deep dive on the government stimulus packages and, uh, and um, the virus spread across different countries. The size of the economic stimulus packages varies significantly across the European countries. But you see that the largest economies like uh, Germany, France, Italy, UK, Spain, all have, have imposed the largest stimulus, both in terms of, of um, absolute numbers, but, but more relevant to look at this time uh, as percentage of GDP, all of them having more than 10% packages over 10% of GDP. Then we have another group in the middle uh, where you see uh, some of the Nordic countries uh, between 5 to 10 percent of GDP and then a last group with less than 5 percent. And the Nordic countries you see range between 5 percent and 8 percent of GDP as, as of today. With Denmark being the, the country with the highest package of, uh, at 8 percent of uh, GDP. This, the, it's interesting to reflect on the, the level of the, uh, this stimulus uh, as percent of GDP compared to, for example, Germany and Italy, who, uh, who have who relies on 21 to 22 percent of GDP, so significantly uh, more in those countries. And also looking at the number of cases, the, how, the, how much uh, the virus has spread is, is, uh, is very different across the, the countries. 
where you see Italy and Spain uh, having being the most infected we, with 3,500 to 4,500 cases per, per million people. And, and looking into the Nordics, we, uh, Sweden sticks out with the highest number of, of uh, confirmed cases and, and an indicator of, of uh, how long the, how much the virus has spread in society already. However, these numbers are, are very, uh, very much driven by how much are you are each country testing its population for for the virus and we and uh, as information in Sweden uh, the government is testing very few people meaning that this this number is likely very very low looking at the looking in more detail on the stimulus packages in the Nordic countries we see that the governments offer offer uh, varying levels of support. All include tax deferrals and loan guarantees, but approach to fixed cost compensation and salary support varies. Denmark and Norway have fixed cost compensation, while Sweden and Finland has not. However, Sweden has introduced possibility to negotiate rent costs with, with their tenants through the government. And Finland has no salary support, but has made it easier to lay off people instead and increased the compensation to unemployed people. Hence, countries are all trying to, to achieve the same thing here, but we are taking a bit of a different approach and, and, and for sure will have somewhat different results. So moving on to the to focusing in or zooming in on the consumer sector, what what are the COVID nineteen impact uh, on on our sector? And and um, I will give you a short summary here and uh, uh, of what examples that we see. Um, for example, food and personal care retailers face increased demand, while others fight for survival. Consumers' hygiene and health awareness has increased. Anxiety about well-being and increasing skepticism to physical proximity will reshape the consumption behavior going forward. Another trend that has grown strong due to the situation is the importance of the local community. And the lack of physical experience today is likely to turn into a demand for experience going forward. On the e-commerce and digitalization side, uh, we've seen a, a strong acceleration due to the COVID-19. And, and this is expected uh, also to continue in the longer, longer term. There are consolidation opportunity uh, occurring in many segments. And there's a chance for uh, opportunistic M&A to, to uh, reposition uh, your portfolio. We also see retailers very active on the cost side. And for now, many, mainly with a sure, short term actions made available through governments. But we expect that more longer term and proactive operational improvements will be made with, within short. The investments that are done uh, right now are mainly in the area to meet the changing consumer behaviors the personas uh, Anders have been uh, have have uh, explained to us and the last impact uh, to highlight is the impact on the supply chains where number of suppliers and geographical location of suppliers are being looked into to secure supply so Moving on to taking the channel perspective on, on, the, on consumer and uh, comparing what's happening within the physical retail world uh, with the digital retail, uh, retail world. We see that it, it varies very much by, by, by these channels and there's a significant damage for the physical retail at the moment, but there are positive effects on e-commerce subscription models and marketplaces. 
physical stores are faced with a significant negative impact in the shorter term due to the uh, restrictions imposed in, in, in societies uh, across our four countries. But also in the long term, uh, and, and uh, this trend uh, as a trend that has been in existing already before uh, the, the virus wire spread. But the longer term trend is, is not deemed to be as, as uh, of course, as significant as, as uh, the short term impact right now. A short term impact we see uh, is increased demand for local products and retailers, as well as the emphasis on retailers role as a good citizen. In the long term, we believe that retailers that provide value through exclusive ranges customer service or shopping experience will be rewarded. And the digital channels, they all benefit from this situation, but they face another type of challenge with uh, being the unforeseen demand increase, which has put very much pressure on their operations. Changing view here and uh, go taking, uh, looking at the impact from a consumer goods or, or a subsector perspective, we see that the impact varies very much uh, by sub -seg segment with non discretionary products growing in the long term and discretionary products facing, facing moderate damage. And what we're looking at here is, of course, they, they are. Uh, observation and, and examples on a, on a fairly high level. And in order to make this re fully relevant to you and your companies, we need to look at that. You need to look at your sector and your company and, and make this, may, this more situation specific to be, to be fully relevant. But some examples are that in the short term, non-discretionary products such, uh, such as food and beverage everyday essentials and hygiene has had an increase in demand. Also in the short term, local regional products like, uh, is likely to, to gain momentum. Brand propositions around safety and reliability is honored and packaged food products being uh, consumed, consumed at home. With, with the long-term trends of consumers' hygiene and health awareness, and excited about well-being and increasing skepticism to uh, physical proximity. Consumers will probably continue cooking at, cooking at home as hesitant to eat out lingers and a desire to main, maintain a safe home base continues. And consumers will likely continue to look for healthy, natural, local, genuine produce where, uh, where possible. This, this all gives a positive view on the long-term impact on the discretionary products. Uh, in the contrary, uh, discretionary products like fashion, consumer electronics have faced a sharp decline uh, in demand in the short term. And there is a risk for a slow recovery as consumers continue to limit the, the discretionary spending. So how do you plan your response in this situation? Our methodology is to first determine the most likely economic development scenario for, for, uh, for your country based on the wire spread, government stimulus and how fast consumers will go back to business as usual when, when allowed. The second step is to determine the most likely hypothesis for your company and subsector. How does the impact look like for your company and subsector? To which extent will changes in customer behavior be sustained. And a third step is to determine the actions for now, next and beyond based on chosen scenario and hypothesis. For example, what are the gaps to meet the hypothesis in your subsector? What activities should be prioritized given timing of economic development? And which activities can be identified as no regret regardless of scenario. So, with this, we come to the end of this presentation. I hope this have 
has given you some valuable insights and inspiration on how to think about the future. And we're happy to uh, get on the phone after this to discuss your specific situation and, and uh, looking forward to, to hearing from you. So thank you very much for today. And uh, I hope that we uh, can uh, talk to each other again next week. Thank you, Anas and Michael, and thank you for everybody participating. Please stay safe, safe and have a wonderful day.